You're listening to The Drag. It's finally starting to feel like spring in Austin. Kayaks and paddle boards fill Ladybird Lake, the body of water that cuts through downtown Austin. The temperature is in the mid-70s, a perfect Austin day, comfortable enough to wear short sleeves to meander through downtown, which is ideal considering the city is in the middle of South by Southwest, its biggest annual festival. There are dozens of celebrities in town, Nick Offerman, Tiffany Haddish, Tracy Morgan, Emily Blunt, and John Krasinski, to name a few. Hundreds of films, documentaries, and TV shows are being screened, like the horror film A Quiet Place and the Mr. Rogers documentary Won't You Be My Neighbor. Festival attendees flock to panels with names like How K-Pop Grew Beyond Niche and Breakthrough Innovators Who Changed the World. It's nearly 5 p.m. on a Thursday, which means lines snake around bars as excited festival goers wait to get into the evening's hottest events, like musical showcases with Khalid and Old Crow Medicine Show. More than 2,000 artists will perform on Austin stages this week. A current of excitement pulses throughout the city, but underneath that, there's also a feeling of fear. It's March 15th, 2018. It's been 13 days since the serial bombings began in Austin, Texas. Two people are dead, and two more victims of an unknown bomber are recovering in the hospital. By now, the serial bomber has hit three different homes, one in northeast Austin, one on the east side, and one in a neighborhood southeast of downtown. To visualize this, you need to understand a bit about how Austin is laid out. So I'll map it out for you. The majority of the city is framed by two main highways, each running north to south. The highway to the east is Interstate 35, which runs all the way from Laredo, Texas, to Duluth, Minnesota. The highway to the west is Mopac Boulevard, It's named after the Missouri Pacific Railroad, whose tracks run parallel to the highway in Austin. Just off of Mopac sits Travis Country, a neighborhood southwest of downtown Austin by about nine miles. It's farther away from the city, which means the homes here are larger. Most of the houses were built in the mid-1970s. Jeff and Amy Sasser live on Eagle Feather Drive, in a two-story brick house shaded by several large trees. Their two daughters lived there, too, until they grew up and moved out. Jeff and Amy are empty nesters, and their house is quieter. There aren't as many people coming and going from their home these days. On a normal spring day, they hear traffic on nearby roads and the occasional sound of children playing outside. But today isn't a normal spring day. There's a knock on the door. Jeff and Amy aren't expecting anyone, but they open it anyway. It's a young man, maybe in his late teens or early 20s. He's wearing a gray hoodie, and a small backpack hangs low from his shoulders. He's clean-shaven and pale, with short, dark hair. He asks to come into their house to charge his phone, but Amy can sense something off. His story was that he had wrecked his car... He was trying to get a hold of his dad. He had been at South By and gotten lost and gotten separated from his friends that he was there with. And that he, and then he ended up on our front porch, which, as you know, is way off the beaten path from any any trail that he would have gotten on. Nothing he's saying adds up. Even if he were a tourist, why would he be this far away from the city? The city's largest greenbelt is nearby, but it's at least an eight-mile walk through hiking paths. Why would he hike eight miles to charge his phone? Plus, the nearest trail opening is two miles away. Why would he travel that far to their house? Amy is suspicious, but ultimately decides to help him. Austin may be a big city, but Southern hospitality is still woven into the moral code here. She draws the line at letting him inside, but she gives him a phone charger and shows him a power outlet on the front porch. He sits there for almost an hour. 
it just didn't make any sense. He said he went to Austin High. I started asking, who's your favorite teacher? And I started asking him some questions. He couldn't answer any of those questions. It was obvious he had not gone to Austin High. Austin High sits just west of downtown. If he went to school there, he would definitely know better places to charge his phone than eight miles away. The young man mumbles as he speaks, and Jeff isn't buying his story. We told him to his face, we don't think you're telling us the truth. At that point, we were we shifted to just getting him away from us. And that was when she thought of the Uber ride, get him where he needs to go and get him away from here. I said, well, if I call an Uber, you know, can, would you take an Uber? Would that help you to get where you need to be? And he was like, yeah, you know, that'd be great. So I called an Uber and um, I was able to talk to the driver on the phone. And I said, well, we don't know this guy. Um, and, you know, just take him where he needs to go. We, we ended up dropping him over in Westgate somewhere, like in some apartments over there somewhere. Jeff and Amy moved on with their day. They didn't give much thought to the strange young man on their doorstep, and they especially didn't think he'd return to their neighborhood three days later with an intent to kill. I'm Ashley Miznazi, and you're listening to Season 2 of Darkness, about the Austin serial bombings in 2018. Investigators are feeling the pressure. The hundreds of law enforcement officials working the case, from the FBI, ATF, and APD, are still considering the connection of race between the victims. But with no news, the community on the east side, mostly black and Latinx families, turn to each other for support. More than 400 people gather at the Greater Mount Zion Baptist Church, less than a mile away from the home where Draylon Mason died. It's a Friday night, and the church is hosting a town hall to allow the community to gather, grieve, ask questions, and hopefully find answers. The two people killed in the bombings were both black, and the third bomb targeted a 75-year-old Hispanic woman and her mother. Austin's residents of color are wondering if they're next. The Austin Justice Coalition a racial justice group that focuses on improving the quality of black lives in Austin, has teamed up with the Austin Black Lives Matter Civil Rights Group and the NAACP to offer advice on how the community can protect itself. The town hall's focus is on safety. Some of the major discussion topics include how to explain the bombings to kids and what to do if you receive a package you weren't expecting, But it's also about community and how it's important to get to know your neighbors. Chas Moore is the founder and executive director of the Austin Justice Coalition. He helped organize the town hall. We was just really encouraging people to look out for your neighbors, look out for the people that see your left and right and across the street um, until we get through this. And, um, you know, a lot of people really appreciate that we did that, that we came out. Um, in the midst of this, you know, this 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 guy being out here doing these heinous things. I had people call me from like all over the rural, um, had neighbors like doing like neighborhood meetups to to introduce one another. So they knew um, who, who belonged in the neighborhood, if you will. It's March 18th. A man in his early 20s drives up to a FedEx in Sunset Valley a small enclave city surrounded by Austin on all its sides. It's just after 7.30 p.m. on a Sunday, so the shopping center is winding down after a busy day. The man parks his red Ford Ranger and walks into the FedEx. He wears a dark green t-shirt, jeans, and a navy baseball cap. He's got wild blonde hair. It looks fake, like a wig from a party store. As he sets two packages down on the counter, the FedEx employee notices he smells like burnt plastic. The employee helps him mail his packages, and the mysterious guy exits the store. He looks down at a hand-drawn map, then gets into his truck. He drives a few miles northwest to Travis Country, the same neighborhood he'd stopped by to charge his phone three days earlier. Just around the corner from Jeff and Amy Sasser's house is Don Song Drive. 
It's a pretty short road with a cul-de-sac at the end, lined with a handful of homes. As the sun is setting, the man parks his truck nearby. Soon, it will be completely dark. He takes a large red sign out of his truck and walks along a sidewalk about halfway down Don Song Drive. He drives the red sign into the grass, between the curb and the sidewalk. It's about a foot wide and a foot and a half tall. He steps away and admires his work. The sign reads, Drive like your kids live here. It's appropriate. It's a family-friendly neighborhood, and kids are constantly playing in the cul-de-sac. There's uh, some little girls that live down in the cul-de-sac. They, they were out playing, and they think they saw him and didn't really think anything of it. The girls down in the cul-de-sac pay it no more attention. There are always people out and about in the neighborhood, so it's not strange to see somebody on the sidewalk. He pulls out a steel eye bolt. It looks like a standard screw, except it's got a ring attached to one end. He stakes it into the grass across from the sidewalk from the sign. The bolt sticks out of the ground about two inches. He ties one end of a line of fishing wire to the bolt and another end to the sign. Then he leaves. True crime lovers, get ready to uncover cold cases that you won't hear anywhere else. I'm excited to share with you another podcast that I know you'll love, The Fault Line. On each episode, The Fall Line digs deep into code cases that have received little, if any, public attention. They focus on unsolved murders, unidentified persons, and disappearances, particularly those involving communities marginalized by mainstream media or investigation. Through expert interviews and long-form coverage of cases like those of the Millbrook Twins, Raymond Green, Robert Martin, and Elia Banderas, The Fall Line takes you deep inside these cases and explores the cutting-edge science and technology that could help solve them. I recommend our listeners check out their episodes on The Victims of Samuel Little, as well as their look into a little-known series of Atlanta serial killings, including the historical Atlanta Ripper to the Atlanta Lover's Lane murders. Both great series. If you love diving deep into unsolved cold cases, join The Fall Line on their quest to uncover these ignored stories. We really enjoy this podcast, and we think you will too. Check out The Fall Line on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hi, I'm Aurora, the host of the drag's newest podcast, Planet Texas, a five-part series about climate change in Texas. Now, you might be thinking, climate change? That sounds like a huge bummer. I'm just here for more cheerful stuff, like true crime. But I promise you this isn't a show to fuel your sense of doom. It's about how regular people are fighting back against climate change in their own backyards and finding hope for the future. Planet Texas can be found wherever you get your podcasts starting Tuesday, September 13th. I'll see you there. A devastating winter storm, millions without power, hundreds dead. How could this happen in the energy capital of America? The market was killing people in their homes, and I, I had lost faith in it. And every decision we made at that point forward was to get the lights on. I'm Mose Bouchelle. I'll be your host for The Disconnect. Power, politics, and the Texas blackout. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. Like this show and want to make your own? Let me tell you about Anchor. For starters, it's free. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. And now, you can even add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. The possibilities are endless for what you can create, whether it's music analysis, your own radio show, or something the world's never heard before. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. With more intense floods, hurricanes, and fires bearing down on us relentlessly, more and more people are starting to wonder why exactly it's taken so long to act on climate. Drilled, a true crime podcast about climate change, tells that story. From the origins of climate denial to the century-long history of corporate propaganda, Drilled investigates all the various blockers to climate action. 
There are seven narrative seasons for you to dig into so far, and in between those seasons, the show puts out weekly episodes to keep listeners up to date on climate news. Check it out wherever you get your podcasts. Back at the command center, investigators are stumped. The bomber hasn't struck in nearly a week. Hundreds of tips have come into the command center where various local, state, and federal authorities work to figure out who's behind the attacks. But nobody's been arrested. The night before, somebody made a bomb threat at a South by Southwest concert venue. The hip-hop band The Roots were supposed to play at a warehouse in East Austin. The promoters canceled the event to be cautious, and authorities tracked down the man who threatened the venue. They arrested him for making a terroristic threat, but they've determined he's not the person behind the package bombs. My name is Jason Hudson. Uh, I currently serve as an assistant special agent in charge for the San Antonio Division of the FBI. Uh, I've been with the FBI about 16 years now, during which a large majority of that time I worked counterterrorism matters, both international and domestic. It's been more than two weeks since the first explosion, And investigators aren't much closer to figuring out who is leaving bombs all over the city. As as the weeks went on, you know, I could really sense as a leader that uh, morale was 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 low. Folks were getting frustrated. We had a very active threat and we just we, we weren't effective at stopping it yet. And so really trying to keep people motivated was was very, very challenging. The FBI, ATF, and the Austin Police Department hold another joint press conference. But this time, Interim Police Chief Brian Manley does something different. He speaks directly to the bomber, pleading with him. He says he wants to talk. We hope this person or persons is watching and will reach out to us before anyone else is injured or anyone else is killed out of this event. These events in Austin have garnered worldwide attention, and we assure you that we are listening. We want to understand what brought you to this point, and we want to listen to you. Manley announces that the reward for any information leading to a conviction had increased to $100,000, in addition to the governor's $15,000 reward. A reporter asks what much of the city has been wondering. Are the bombings terrorism-related? Chief Manley says they're looking into every possible scenario, but he doesn't really answer the question. We still do not know what ideology may be behind this, what the motive was behind this, and that's why it's important right now that we have the opportunity to speak with the subject or subjects that are responsible for this so we can understand what's happening here. Three years after the bombings, here's what Chief Manley had to say about the decision to speak directly to the bomber. So as we as as the investigation continued, uh, we did have the behavioral analysts, uh, the specialized agents from the FBI and the ATF join the investigation. And in partnership with them, we were looking at our public messaging and we came to the decision that it was time for me to speak directly to the bomber, letting that person know that. We understood they were trying to deliver a message. However, we don't know what that message is. And to please make contact with us so that we could avoid any more unnecessary death and that we could hear that person out. Later that day, the city finally begins to quiet. South by Southwest ended that morning, and a few parties are dying down as the evening approaches. It's a Sunday the last day of spring break for many local families, and Jeff and Amy Sasser have just pulled into their driveway. They stayed at Amy's family ranch all weekend, so they plan to unwind on the couch and not move for a few hours after they unpack. Just a few homes down, the red sign that reads, drive like your kids live here, is still standing. Moments pass, and the sun ducks behind the horizon. At this point, The sign and the steel bolt staked into the grass are almost entirely invisible. It's dark, so you can't see the two men approaching. But you could hear them. One rides a bike, and the other walks alongside him. Will Grody appears under the street lamp, riding his bike. He's in his early 20s, lean and clean-cut. 
His friend, Colton Mathis, walks beside him on the sidewalk. He's a little more scruffy than Will. He's sporting a full-grown beard. They've been friends since high school. They both turn the corner onto Dawn Song Drive. A few homes away, Jeff and Amy sit in their sunroom. They've unpacked from their trip and are watching TV, enjoying their last few quiet hours before their busy week begins. Then, a loud noise interrupts their relaxing Sunday evening. It definitely didn't come from the TV. It's so loud, their house shakes. Jeff looks through the window behind the TV and sees chunks of grass, wood, and debris flying past their house. Jeff and Amy look at each other, and they jump into action. It sounded kind of like an odd car wreck. We just ran outside, ran around to see what was going on. It was dark. He runs around the corner, but what he finds doesn't make any sense. He sees a bicycle on the ground, and he thinks, maybe a car hit a cyclist. But the only car in sight is a small one, undamaged. Plus, it's parked and nobody's in it. That couldn't have been what made the noise. Then, he spots Will and Colton on the ground. Jeff recognizes Will, who competed on the same swim team as his daughter. And so... I saw the two, the, the two young men there. One of them was Will, and asked him what happened. I saw the bleeding. I saw the shock. Will and Colton can't form the words to describe what happened to them. They're both in shock. Colton can't even respond. Will's a little more conscious than Colton, but he still can't manage to piece together a story for Jeff. The red sign that reads, Drive like your kids live here, has split into dozens of pieces. Fragments of the sign litter the road. Jeff can't even read what it says. Jeff knows Will and Colton are badly injured, and he knows something terrible has happened, but he still can't manage to put it together. But when he notices the nails embedded in Will and Colton's legs, he runs back home to find anything he could use to help them. When he gets there, Amy is already on the phone calling 911. They scramble to find their first aid kit and water to clean the wounds. When Jeff runs back outside to Will and Colton, more neighbors have trickled out onto their front porches. He's flustered, but he knows he needs to pull himself together to help Will and Colton. He prepares to dress their wounds. But then he hears the sirens approaching in the distance, and he knows it's best to step back and let the professionals take care of the young men. Investigators rush to the scene. They walk down the street, flashlights jolting left to right, guiding their way to the sidewalk where Will and Colton are. The bike lays askew in the street, broken pieces of the red sign surrounding it. Austin police officers survey the area right around the sidewalk. One officer notices something, so he calls to his partner standing on the street. Here's body cam footage from that officer. Dooley, grab me a piece of tape for right here. A tape or a cone? It's a tripwire. It's a tripwire. Not a package, nothing like the previous bombs. The bomber strung a fishing line across the sidewalk to trigger the explosion. This is the kind of stuff I've seen in Iraq. I'm Megan Parker, the host of Devilish Deeds, a new podcast from The Drag, which produced the popular true crime podcasts The Orange Tree and Darkness, The Austin Bomber. Devilish Deeds tells the story of the eight people, mostly black women working as domestic servants for rich white families, who were viciously murdered by the servant girl Annihilator, a serial killer who terrorized the small frontier town of Austin, Texas in the 1880s. In this four-part series, I'll trace the steps of one of America's first serial killers and explore the theories behind who might have done it. Subscribe to Devilish Deeds, out now, wherever you get your podcasts. Law enforcement officials have been following two potential suspects in the bombings, watching them around the clock. But neither of them were anywhere near the bomb. They're back to square one. They have no idea who did this. We've said it before on this podcast. Bombs are not common, especially serial bombings. It's why when you hear the names Eric Rudolph or the Unabomber, you might recognize them. There have been very few murderers who use explosive devices as their weapon of choice. According to FBI profilers, the type of killer who uses a bomb usually is emotionally charged, and they often want to punish society for some perceived wrong. 
and they usually want to send a message. FBI case agent Justin Wilson was a beat officer during the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta. That's when Eric Rudolph, dubbed the Olympic Park bomber, had just begun his reign of terror, planting bombs that killed two people and left more than 100 injured. After a five-year manhunt, Rudolph eventually pleaded guilty to at least four attacks in Atlanta, Georgia and Birmingham, Alabama. In two of the Atlanta bombings, Rudolph placed a secondary bomb, time to detonate when first responders arrived on scene. He wanted to attack them, too. Agent Wilson has been on the Austin bomber case since the first bomb, so he begins to wonder, is something similar happening here? Is he changing it also to start setting up secondaries for responders? And so we had to go through and get online with our flashlights And before we could get resources all the way down to where they needed, we were checking for additional tripwires and additional devices in the woods because that area where the tripwire went off had a lot of wooded areas around it. You could have easily concealed another, another device. It's dark and getting darker. Investigators can't see to collect evidence, and they don't know if there are other bombs around. They don't want to put themselves or other neighbors in danger. They also don't want to accidentally damage any valuable evidence since they can't see well, so they lock down the scene until sunrise. They also walk door to door to let residents know they had the option to either leave the neighborhood before they shut it down, or they can stay. But that means they wouldn't be able to leave. Jeff and Amy decide to stay. Everyone in the neighborhood wants to know what's happening. But since officials won't know much more until morning... Alarmed residents use Facebook groups and apps like Nextdoor to keep up with what's going on. The Austin Police Department even partners with Nextdoor to share safety information with the public. All through the night, neighbors refresh threads about roadblocks and neighborhood closures, and they get tips on how to report suspicious activity or share footage from home security cameras. They want to communicate with the public, but officials have to keep certain details to themselves. Remember, they had two suspects before the tripwire bomb. Now, they have zero. We don't put out a lot of details on the mechanism that was used to trigger the device of the bomb or the weapon that was used to commit a homicide because that is information that is usually only known to the suspect. And when we, in fact, take that suspect into custody, if they confess and they give us those details... The only way they could have known that is if they did that because we didn't put that out publicly. So although it's received sometimes as us being defensive or non-transparent with information, it's really an attempt to protect the integrity of the investigation. The next morning, investigators arrive at the scene as soon as it's light enough to see. A photographer from the local newspaper, the Austin American Statesman, took some aerial images with the drone. It's hard to see the debris and damage from so far above the street, but the scene still looks chaotic. We counted, and in the photo, there are at least 30 investigators spread out along Don Song Drive, all wearing white hazmat suits. They place small, yellow, numbered evidence markers next to every piece of shrapnel they can find, which is a lot. Using a tripwire is a complete change of method for this unknown bomber. The first three bombs were all wrapped inside packages, delivered on the doorsteps of the victims. Stefan House and Hope Herrera had picked up the packages they found, and Draylen Mason activated the explosion when he opened the box. The tripwire bomb was constructed similarly to the first three bombs, but the setup was totally different. With the tripwire, it was out in the open, stretched across a sidewalk of a residential neighborhood. The bomber wasn't targeting one specific person or family. It could have injured or killed anyone passing by. Officials spent so much time trying to find links between the victims that just weren't there. So now, the random nature of the tripwire bomb meant the bomber didn't care who his victims were. Agent Jordana Nesvog, the FBI civilian analyst, said this changed the entire investigation. And so I think that that was an important development in in 
you know, all the work that was being done across the Intel team, um, where we were spending so much time looking at the victims and trying to really identify the bomber out of who the bomber had targeted. And so now, now we have something that could, it could have been two little kids. It could have been an, an older couple walking down the street, and you know, it was um, two young men. And um, so I, I think that that, to me, that was the most significant finding out of that bombing. We checked in with the two men injured in the tripwire bombing, and honestly, they were pretty difficult to track down. They're the only bombing victims who managed to completely avoid the press. And they did so for a number of reasons. They didn't want to share anything that could compromise a federal investigation. But they were also scared. They didn't know that the tripwire was a completely random attack. They initially thought they had been targeted, and they didn't want the bomber targeting them again. They worried for their safety. They didn't get any relief from those worries until the FBI let them know that anyone could have triggered the tripwire. They were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. We spoke with Will's dad on the phone about three years after the bombings. He told us Will and Colton share a certain degree of sympathy for the bomber. They feel like the bomber must have had some mental health troubles, given what this individual was capable of doing. They felt sorry for the person who'd attacked them. Will and Colton, as well as their families, don't want to relive the details of what happened, which makes total sense. It was traumatic. But Will's dad did want to share why he agreed to a phone call with us. These young men just want to get on with their lives. The night of March 19th, investigators are still trying to put the pieces together. They're still wondering... Who is this bomber? And where will he strike next? Then, just before midnight, Interim Police Chief Brian Manley gets a call from the FBI. Another bomb has exploded, more than 60 miles away, in a FedEx distribution center in Schertz, Texas, outside of San Antonio. Bombs are rare enough. This has to be related to the Austin investigation. But if it is the work of the unknown bomber attacking Austin, he's changed up his strategy yet again. Next, on season two of Darkness. The fact that if you're shipping a bomb via FedEx, now you're talking trucks and interstate commerce, you're talking airplanes, you know, and just the worst case scenario in your mind is like, oh no, we could have planes falling from the sky because this guy is you know, shipping bombs through the air. Most Americans believe freedom of religion is a right, even when your religion is a little unconventional. I am the mystic mother of the Phoenix Goddess Temple. But what happens when your beliefs, sexuality can be sacred, might be against the law? Bam, 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 please. Witnessed, Mystic Mother is available now. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts to binge all episodes or listen weekly wherever you get your podcasts. Season two of Darkness is reported, hosted, written, and directed by me, Ashley Miznazi. This podcast is presented by The Drag, a student-run audio production house at the University of Texas at Austin's Moody College of Communication. Katie Penchik outka and Robert Quigley are the executive producers. This podcast was also reported and written by Kenny Jones. The editor is Katie Penchik outka The associate producers are Austin Cheatham, Libby Cohen, Alexandra Curry-Buckner, Cecilia Garzella, Gregory Gonzalez, Anastasia Goodwin, Jay Kerman, Jackie Ibarra, Marian Navarro, Ileana Rowland, Sarah Schleed, Aiden Snazdell, and Harrison Young. Their artwork was created by Helen Holsey. Christian McDonald is the drag's technical director. A huge thank you to Leslie Schrock for all of her support and guidance. I also want to thank Jay Bernhardt, Kathleen McElroy, Rachel Davis-Mercy, Allison Dawson, Kathleen Mabley, Emily Quigley, Jay Whitman, Eric Tang, Robert Vilwalk, and Ryan Outka. Special thanks to Grace Spees, Marcus Crum, Raul Garcia, Dylan Lee, 
Jennifer Robbins, Tasha Turner, Amanda Cisneros, Jenny Nelson Gray, and Tiffany Ma. The Drag is a nonprofit educational organization that is made possible by donors like you. Please support our work by going to thedragaudio.com/donate. Every dollar goes directly to producing more content like this while giving students an amazing educational experience. Thank you.